So my guest today is Justin Wynn, N-G-U-Y-E-N, the founder of Get Your Grind Up, a movement to help students navigate their way through college. If you're an adult listening to this, this show will be for you because you may have kids that we're going to be talking to, but we're also attempting to speak to them. I'll do translations along the way. He's the host of the iTunes Top 100 podcast, Declassified College, where each episode is bite-sized content that unlocks one sheet code, one tip, one cliff note, excuse me, I promised I'd do translations, to thriving in college. He's grown his podcast through his LinkedIn content where he has over 7,000 followers and receives over 200,000 views each month. Justin, nice to meet you here. It's great. To, it's a pleasure to be on the show. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. So let's go right in. Let's hit it right hard. What's the number one cheat? What's the number one thing we have to talk about with getting an internship? Yeah, I mean, I guess this tip could apply, right? If you're looking for a job as well, but even if you're a parent and your your son or daughter is looking for an internship, this is sort of the number one mindset shift that I think helps out a lot of students along the way. And what that is, is understanding that it isn't necessarily everything um, on a resume that really matters. And the reason for that, especially when it comes to internships is because a lot of students lie on their resume. And because of that, from an employer standpoint, it's very risky to hire any student, whether it's an internship or an entry level position. So what I want students to start thinking and what you can teach your student is start thinking of what can you build to showcase the skills that are on your resume. And what that means is by, by being able to build something, whether it's a podcast, a social media account, um, a, a project, whatever that may be, it shows that you, not just, that you can not just say that you have the skills, that you can actually do it. And the reason that I say that is one of my first internships that I got one on like the second or third week, they, they brought us all in into a room and said, who here knows Microsoft Excel? And everyone raised their hand because you want to show off that you're good at something. And then the next question was, who here knows what a pivot table is? And I didn't raise my hand because I didn't know what a pivot table was at the time, but everyone else raised their hand. Then the third question, who wants to volunteer to do a pivot table? Nobody volunteered. And that's exactly what you don't want to do when it comes to your resume or um, trying to get a job is you want to just say what you actually know. And the best way to showcase that is by building a project on the side and being able to show that to whoever it is that's, that's looking to hire you. That scenario that you described, Justin, reminds me of a classic joke about uh, it's a military scenario. They're all in formation, lined up. Okay, who's going to volunteer? And everyone but one person steps backward. <laughs> <laughs> yep, exactly. And it's it's something that you don't realize, right, until you actually get tested on it. I mean, I, I have numerous examples myself when it came to, I applied to a marketing internship. I'd never done really any legitimate marketing before. And they're like, hey, Justin, have you ever written a blog before? I was like, I mean, what's the difference between a blog and a five paragraph essay? So I said, yes. And I wrote the blog, which was really just a five paragraph essay and never heard back. And now that I know how writing works, that's the complete opposite of what a blog actually is. <laughs> and it's funny how often that happens. You know, the student has a belief in how the world works and discovers the hard way. It's not quite that way. Yeah. And I want to be that person that takes all the lessons and all, all the hard lessons that I had to learn uh, growing up in college and being able to showcase it so that other students don't have to follow in my own footsteps. They can skip through all those failures. And the show, folks, is a good show. You know, he brings on different people to talk about their careers. He offers advice. You know, it's, it's a nice. How many times a week do you do the show? Uh, it's three times a week. That's what I thought. Three time a week show with great information, really geared to the student audience. So how does someone get an internship? You know, we're talking about showcasing uh, their experience, but that isn't how you got some of your internships, is it? Yeah, no, not at all. I, I mean, I thought that to get an internship, right, all you needed was good grades and you joined the school clubs because that's sort of what you're told growing up. So I did that. And I had a near 4.0 and I joined the student clubs on campus um, my sophomore year of college. 
And I started to apply to internships because again, that's what you're supposed to do your sophomore year going into your junior year. I applied to 50 plus and I didn't even get a call back from any of them. It was just a straight up rejection email or it was just left on red and I would never hear back from them ever again. But fast forward, I ended up graduating with five internships, three at Fortune 150 companies. And the sole reason that I got all of those internships besides one was because I found someone on the inside and I turned that person into my champion. And once you have that champion, that's when that project really comes into play because you can show that champion your project and they can be like, oh, okay, Justin actually knows what he's doing. And then they can go to the hiring manager or whoever it may be and say, hey, you need to hire Justin because he's already shown to me that he can do X, Y, Z. And folks, I'm just gonna tell the adults in in the room, you notice how this works? It's not about having a great resume. And this is going to be true for you. It's so much about, and this is my philosophy, where you can cut the line. You cut the line to get to the front. You know, I had a great experience. You know, we adopted our son uh, from Kazakhstan in Central Asia. And when we returned, we had to fly up by way of Moscow. And the culture in Moscow is one where parents with very young children can walk to the front of any line. Really? Amazing. And we're at the airport. We've got to get through customs because we've flown in from another country. And there looked like 500 people in the airport. And they're all waving us to the front of the line. <laughs> Why, what's, so, what's so different about wanting to do that in your career? Exactly. I mean, that's sort of the perspective that I always take, right? Life is a game. That's how I like to think of it. And just like any video game growing up that I played, there's always these cheat codes that not necessarily everyone knows about. And that's what, that's sort of the branding behind the podcast of here are these cheat codes that I've either learned from myself or that you can learn from other students from across the world and professionals from across the world. So you don't have to necessarily do the research. You just have to find out about the podcast. So from there, let's see now. The first thing is have a representative sample of what you can do. Make it great. Have it look terrific if if you're in, in a visual profession but something that represents you at your best for the field or for the internship that you want to do, right? Yep, exactly. Number two is don't just mass mail your resume. Try and find someone to become your champion. Mm -hmm. So you can show this to them unless they can advocate for you. Yeah. Yep. It's, it's like the complete opposite of networking that we're told growing up. Right. Uh, I think a lot of people's views on networking is how many people do I know? And yes, that's half of it. But the side that no one ever talks about is it doesn't actually matter how many people you know, it's who remembers you. And that's what is really important when it comes to networking. And I'm just trying to get that mindset shift for for as many people around the world as possible. Because once you learn that, that's when you can actually start getting some positions under your belt. And this is the, um, the notion of branding that adults find so frustrating. You know, to me, branding is a lifelong journey. You want to create an image for yourself because it's not just simply what you know, but who knows about you, who's willing to advocate for you and help you cut the line. Again, back to the notion of networking. You know, I'm someone who's got number one podcast and Apple podcast 1800 plus episodes as of this recording, a great YouTube channel with more than 9,000 videos on it, you know, OTT television, yada, yada, yada. And people come to me because of, they've seen me. They have an impression of me. And there are ways that each individual, even the student can do the same thing. Exactly. It's, it's super important when it comes to being that person that when someone thinks of a certain thing, They think of you, your name and your face. And when you get that brand recognition in someone's brain, it's amazing when it comes to whether it's opportunities that they could provide you in the future, or even if it's just being able to remember your name when you walk, uh, when you walk by them on the street or the store, whatever it may be. So we've got two so far. What else can people do in order to get that internship that's going to be the launch point for them personally and professionally? Of course. Uh, So the next one I want to talk about is going to be a LinkedIn hack. 
Uh, and again, you can use this on uh, whether you're a student or if you're 20 years into your profession. So what most people don't realize about LinkedIn is it's probably the number one search engine when it comes to finding pro, uh, professional, your professional network. And if you understand that and you understand how to use that search bar, it can open up numerous opportunities because how most people connect on LinkedIn is they just send a generic um, connection request. So they just click the blue button and then that's it. There's no personalization to it. But what you can actually do is add a personalized note. So then the next question is, what do you put in that personalized note? So for, for any student out there, right, this is what you do. Let's say you've gotten one internship or maybe you've worked um, a part-time job while you're in college. You're going to put past companies that someone has worked for. There's that filter for that. And then you click whatever internship or company that you've worked for, click that. And then you put your school um, as so you can find alumni. So once you've got those two connection points, now LinkedIn is going to populate with five or 10 or hundreds of people that have had a similar career path as you. And you just send them a connection request saying, Hey, my name is Justin Wynn. I saw that you, you worked at Lockheed Martin. I interned there. I would love to understand more about how you transitioned from UCF to Lockheed Martin and your acceptance rate for um, LinkedIn requests are going to skyrocket. If you just add a two minute research process to that. Um, that's all it takes. And you'll be able to hop on 10, 15, 20 minute phone calls with people. And you'll actually get an understanding of what a job actually looks like and what they actually do. And for a lot of adults, you know, the non-student population, the same strategy works beautifully as well. Connecting with people who have a similar background to you always works because they'll go back and look at the profile, confirm that what you told them is true. Because like you said, I know this is a shock. People lie. <laughs> exactly. I mean, just take, for instance, this, uh, this relationship, right? Uh, if I, I, I probably could have just tried to connect with you on LinkedIn and said, Hey, Hey Jeff, like connect with me and press that blue button. But because I took the time to do a little bit of research and I reached out to you via email and said, Hey, we're both sort of in the same industry in the career space. I would assume that's probably why you were a little bit more open to, to answering that email rather than if I just said, hey, let's connect on LinkedIn or something like that. Right. Uh, unlike the people who contact me now and here we are and it's always the, hi, would you like to build your coaching practice? You know? <laughs> exactly. You know, something that it's relatable for the individual, something that there's a common identity for always works better. 100%. Couldn't agree more. Well, you could, but let's not go <laughs> overboard. <laughs> so what else can someone do? Hmm. Let's see. The, the next sort of hack, this one is specifically for students, is understanding that your student email can unlock so many doors for you. And I didn't understand this until it was sort of too late in my, my college career. I thought that having Justin at getchogrindup.com was the coolest email in the world. But this is what actually happens when you walk across that stage. When you walk across that stage your senior year and you've graduated and you no longer use your student email and you try to reach out to Jeff or you try to reach out to Justin, we immediately think that you're trying to sell us on something. Immediately because you don't have a student email. But if you have a student email, we have sort of this, this like little message in the back of our head saying, hmm, maybe we should try to help the student out. And we'll take the time to read it, right? And understanding that will increase your open rates for your emails, as well as being you having the chance to meet some really influential people because people are always looking to give back um, when it comes to helping other college students out. Interesting. Uh you have the preference of emailing rather than in-mailing through LinkedIn. Yeah, I, I haven't had great. Yeah, I have, I've had terrible success with in-mail. Um, so I had the, the fortunate chance to be able to be one of LinkedIn's like campus editors. I believe that's what they called when I was a junior in college. And what that allowed me to do was have premium. So I was able to test out in-mail. I probably sent out I don't know, 50 to 100 in mail and 
don't remember one meaningful conversation that came out through there. I had better responses from literally just sending a personalized invite or a personalized connection request or a personalized email. Got it. And it doesn't surprise me because the fact is, this is one of the dirty little secrets of LinkedIn. Not everyone's on the platform all the time. And exactly. There may be 650 million people plus on LinkedIn right now, but you know, the fact of the matter is no one's checking their emails unless they're looking for a job. Not, not because they're trying to help someone. Exactly. So, and in most in mail too, when it comes to this stereotype that LinkedIn is trying to overcome, uh, most people got in mail before because someone was trying to sell them on something, whether it was like that person reaching out to grow your coaching or someone reaching out to me, like I can help you grow your social media. Um, there's that sort of the spamming of in mail that LinkedIn has to overcome. And because of that, most people don't even open their in mail from my understanding. It's, it's fascinating. It makes sense because, you know, I'm a former headhunter and LinkedIn sells this product called LinkedIn Recruiter to headhunters, both corporate and third party. And what the idea is, you get 100 in-mails a month. If you get a response to the in-mail, it's credited back to you. If you don't, bye-bye. And worse than that, if there are too many of those, their analytics have you... They, they'll suspend your ability to send in mails for a period of time if you don't get responses because they want people to do this and they blame the message as being the issue as opposed to the people being on the platform. So yep. where you can, again, circumvent the systems and connect with someone personally. It yeah, makes all and you have difference. no limit. You have no limit. <laughs> well, as long as they're personalized messages, you can't send 125 emails that are identical in the same mass email uh, because then you get identified as a spammer and your stuff gets redirected into the spam folder. Of course, of course. Yeah, I mean, there are limitations, but for the most part, um, there are no limits when it comes to taking a little bit of time to personalize things. Right. And with uh, text expanders, you can have a generalized thing and, and do a little bit of a, a tweak to it each time. So it's not identical. It's similar, customized for the individual. This is cool stuff, Justin. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it, it's all about these little quick hacks that I, I learned in college. Like, for instance, if you use that search filter correctly, right, and you came up with 15 results, you technically could just copy and paste the same personalized connection requests because they all have the same experience but and then just change the name so you've just saved your, yourself a ton of time but also still personalize um uh like 15 uh connection requests as well so just to kind of walk through the uh, the search let's say you're searching for using your example lockheed martin mm -hmm. and then it shows you everyone at lockheed martin um I'm not sure if this is a free account feature or this is a paid account feature, but you go to all filters to get mm -hmm. to where the school is. Yep. No, it's free. Okay. That's a, part of the free one as well. Good. Yep. Cause I've had a paid version now for years. <laughs> I don't remember what's in, in uh, paid versus free, but you're going to all filters, then checking off the school. Uh, and then from there being able to identify anyone who, who hits those two data points. Yep, exactly. You can do that or the other way that you can, you can use your school as a connection point is if you look up your university um, on LinkedIn and you go to their, their company page on LinkedIn, they have what is called the alumni tool. And it literally has every alumni from your university there. And all you have to do is type in, the, there's a search bar, type in whatever keyword that you want. Let's just say you want to talk to someone that works at Google or you want to talk to someone that works at Goldman Sachs. You just type in those keywords and then it'll populate anyone from your school that's an alumni that works at that company. And then you can just reach out and say, hey, for me, it would be like, hey, my name's Justin Wynn. Uh, I'm also a fellow knight and I love to connect with successful um, alumni would love to connect and learn more about what you're doing at Google or whatever it is. Cool. And I think one of the fun extra things is once you've exhausted the school and the employer with those people in the right hand column, there's this fun little feature called 
that that's headlined as uh, people uh, who looked at this profile also looked at these mm -hmm. profiles as well. So you have other people that you might be able to connect with. It's a stretch because you don't have the same necessarily common interest, but I know people who found work that way. 100%. And then just building off of that exact point, um, for your personal page, you don't want to have that turned on. Uh, you can, you can turn it off by going to like your private privacy settings and turning like people also viewed off. And the reason that I say that you don't want people or you don't want that featured on your own personal page is because if you imagine it from a recruiting standpoint, right. And you land on Justin Wynn's profile, right. But then you're scrolling down and someone on the right hand side has a better photo or a better headline, or whatever it may be. Now you've just clicked off of my profile and you've gone to a competitor. So that's why you want to turn that feature off. If you're uh, looking for an internship or, or a job. Gotcha. This is fun stuff. I'm really enjoying this. <laughs> I, I love these, man. It's uh, things that I didn't get taught in school that I wish that they taught in school, but I'm always looking to, to share this knowledge to, to whoever's willing to listen to it, honestly. I think you've got a business model there. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. We'll see if schools are still around after everything going on right now. <laughs> I, I think they're going to come back, but different conversation. So what else can a student do in order to find that internship or even that job after graduation? Yeah, I, I would say like this might sound a lot like a lot of stuff that, that we're talking about, um, but it really breaks down into two things, uh, create a project and then get started on LinkedIn, right? The last thing that you want to do is sort of set up what I like to call the January 1st conundrum, where everyone says that they want to work out this year, right? And then by January 15th, everything they've never worked out ever. So they've just stopped. You want to stop that and you don't want to do that by taking baby steps. So what that might mean first is setting up a basic schedule of, okay, I wake up at, let's say, 8.30 every morning, right? From nine to 10, every single day, I will spend an hour on LinkedIn. Now do that every single day. You don't necessarily know what you want to do, but start doing it. Spend that time. And then you can say from after dinner, from eight to 9.30 PM, I'm going to work on a project. And that's the project that you work on. So as long as you have it in your schedule, you hold yourself accountable. And that will be way better than, let's say, again, going back, in, back out to the working out um, example. Most people will say, I'm going to get fit this year, starting January 1st. I'm going to go to the gym every single day. But when, what ends up happening on the second day, you're a little sore, so you don't want to go. That's the exact opposite that you want to do with this. So maybe two to three times a week, put LinkedIn and put your project into your schedule. And then every two or three weeks or so, add in another day and then add in another day. Being able to go at it slowly and getting better 1% every single day is much better than trying to start off quickly and then ending up at 0% because you gave up after two weeks. So take that approach. That's, that's what I would say is the next sort of cheat code that I would share. It's a marathon, not a sprint. If by some chance in running the marathon, you're able to get an internship, fabulous, fabulous. But the probability is it's a marathon. And having run New York one year and having seen all these people out there on, on the Verrazano Bridge sprinting to the front, and you could see not, they haven't trained and they've got no conditioning. And by the time they get to the other side of the bridge, which is two and a half, three miles later, they're walking already. Mm -hmm. You know they're in trouble. Exactly. Uh, and, and the idea is small incremental steps taken over time works wonders and that's not just simply for this job search for this internship it's for the rest of your career of building a reputation or brand for yourself so that in this way you're able to land and, and people are reaching out to you so you can cut the line exactly and it's managing expectations too right i mean for most people the day that you start looking for a job you probably aren't going to find a job um, even though that is sort of your goal, right? It's it's a long-term play um, for the most time. And and that's what I think a lot of people don't understand, especially students, because they're they're used to, okay, I take a test on Friday. I'm going to get my results back on Tuesday. That's not how finding a job works. It's a long-term process. And we're taught the complete opposite of that in school. It's awful. <laughs> so going back to school for a moment, of course. What, what were you told in school about how you'd find an internship 
or graduate or, or find a job after graduation? What was the lie that they told you? Well, it's a lot of high, high level stuff. So they say, oh, to get an internship, you need to get good grades and you need to join student clubs and you need to um, network and you need to get on LinkedIn. And yes, on surface value, that's correct, right? You need to get good grades. You need to um, join the clubs. You need to do all those things. But what they don't tell you is they don't tell you how to use LinkedIn. They don't tell you how to send a personalized connection request. They don't tell you how to add keywords to your profile. When it comes to why you need to have good grades, it's not to have a high GPA. It's so that you can actually understand and develop the skills that you need for that job. And once you have those skills, building out something to show those skills. So they tell you very high level things when they need to start specifying a little bit more by actually showing some students how to do it. And now some people might say, oh, so you just want to spoon feed all the kids of the world. Yes, a little bit, but you want to help them get a leg up in society, right? That's the whole point of going to college is to get to the next step in your life. And just by giving someone that first step, it would help so many students out there because they just literally believe, I've talked to students, even myself of like, okay, if I get good grades, I'm gonna end up with a job. But then you get to your junior year and you're sitting there with a 4.0 and the kid next to you has a 3.2 and he's interning at Goldman Sachs and you're still working as a cashier at, Ch at Chili's. And you're like, what the heck is going on? And then you get to this downward, uh, downward spiral. So it's, it's very high level when they need to start doing a little bit more tactical stuff. And I'm wondering, using that example, was it Northwestern Mutual that you got an internship at? Yeah, that was my first one. And it literally came from asking a friend for ice cream. Um, so like, we, I mean, we can dive into that story. I love that story. <laughs> <laughs> so, so the way, so this was my first internship after I'd been rejected by 50 plus Northwestern Mutual, probably being one of them, um, if we're being honest, but I was trying to get an internship in finance because I knew that that's what I wanted to do. And when I couldn't find an internship, I went back up to Connecticut because that's where I was originally from. And I was like, okay, I'll spend the summer up here, hang out with some friends and, and maybe I'll find something. I don't know. But then I'm scrolling through my Instagram and I see that one of the kids that I used to play soccer with, he was a senior when I was a freshman in, in high school. He was talking about how he was like the number one intern for Northwestern Mutual. So I was like, oh, wow, that's, that's really cool. Like, let me hit him up and see if he'd be open to asking or to answering some questions that I had. So this is where I differentiate because most people will say, well, probably ask him like, hey, can I get 15 minutes of your time to um, like dissect your brain? And like, who wants to waste 15 to 20 minutes? There's not many people that would want to do that. So what I did was like, Hey, B, uh, really love what you're doing. Saw your, your Instagram post. I'd love to grab some ice cream with you. Who says no to ice cream? No one. No one says no to ice cream, right? So we met up, got some ice cream. I asked him a few questions about how he's been doing, um, how the internship went, um, one, and then yada, yada, yada. One thing led to another. I found out that he was a college unit director um, at Northwestern Mutual. So literally the person in charge of hiring me. And he's like, do you want an internship? And at this point, I was probably two or three weeks late into the internship. And I was like, yeah, I would love one. And he's like, okay, sure, you got it. Let me just set a meeting up with, with the one person that you need to interview. And um, we'll, 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 ha we'll make it happen. Went into the interview. And she was like, well, we're just doing this sort of for formalities. Since B recommended you, we know that you're going to do really well. So we just wanted to get to know you a little bit more before we gave you the offer. And I was like, wow. So this is how the game works. And I've taken that strategy and literally implemented it for like the majority of every single internship that I've gotten. And I, I want to translate this story for the adults, you know, the non-student population, <laughs> the parents. And the story basically says, you know, I was out of luck at this point. I'm doing crap work and I'm doing nothing that interests me. I go home, start living with my parents. I didn't say parents at that time, but... I'll assume parents and I'm sucking wind right now and I'm trying to figure out some way I can network my way. And instead of using LinkedIn, he goes to Instagram, you know, age appropriate location. And he's starting to scroll through the feed and he sees someone he grew up with as uh, number one intern at Northwestern. So instead of saying like you would say, Hey, can I get 15 minutes? I'll buy you a cup of coffee. He goes for something that's more appropriate. Hi, Want to get some ice cream? And they sit down, talk, 
and uh, gets offered the internship on the spot. Confirmation has to come from a real interview, but he cut the line and he did it in his way, doing the same thing you do, but in an appropriate place for his age group. So if you see your son or daughter online, looking at Instagram, just have them redirect the thinking a little bit to see if there's someone that they're connected with who they can reach to. How's that for translation? There you go. I mean, that's perfect. And I think what I didn't realize is how close the college network is. I mean, I went to one of the largest university or the second largest university in, in the world or the US. We have like 70,000 students or something crazy like that. And one of my friends, he's very high up in, in like higher education and he works specifically with UCF on some things. And he was saying, even at UCF, the average touch point that it takes to for any pretty much any student is two. So if you take my one of my friends and f uh, a friend of his, basically I know someone or I know every single person at UCF. Um, and once I realize that and you realize the networking effect from there, you can start to really open up a lot of doors if you're strategic about it because everyone knows everyone, especially on a college campus. So true. Hey, what haven't we covered yet that we should that I haven't asked you about? Hmm, I would say the last the last cheat code that i think can also apply to to your audience listening whether they're college students or um adults in, in the working world is the greatest way to have these conversations with individuals these 15 minute coffee meetings um basically is start your own podcast and here's the reason why if you have a youtube channel right and you reached out to someone and you said hey justin uh, I would love to collaborate with you on my YouTube channel. And I went to go check out your YouTube channel and I saw that you had 50 views. I would probably be a little hesitant to, to work with you uh, just because like, is it worth my time? But if you're looking at it from a job seeking perspective, right? Let's say you want a job in marketing. You start a podcast that is um, talking about interviewing marketing experts one time every single week. So what you do is you find a list uh, you create a list of 10 companies that you would love to work for, find 10 people that work at each of those 10 companies in the marketing space, and you send out a message to them saying, hey, John, or hey, Justin, I saw that you're doing a lot of marketing for Get Your Grind Up. I would love to interview you on my podcast where I interview other um, marketing experts to gain their insights on the industry. You don't have to say that you don't have a job. You don't have to say any of that. You just say that you want to have a conversation with them they will be way more receptive to being able to talking about themselves on a podcast than they will if you ask them for a 15 minute coffee meeting because they feel like they're getting something out of it. And again, they love to talk about themselves. The only thing that you need to have a very reputable podcast is make sure that your cover art looks nice and you can literally pay someone $5 on Fiverr to create that for you if you would like that. Or you can create it yourself on Canva. And then the second thing is you need a few reviews on there. So anywhere between 10 to 20, if you can get that, um, all you have to do is just ask all your friends and families to leave a review. And there you go. You have a legitimately looking podcast and you could theoretically interview anyone that you reached out to that responded. And that's how you start to open doors into that, that marketing world if you wanted a job in marketing. And that can be applied to IT, engineering, whatever industry that you'd like, as long as you have it in that niche uh, sort of category that you want to speak to experts in that industry. Super. And, you know, a slightly different version of this for the very experienced person is writing the book. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you want to interview someone for the book. And more often than not, you'll need to have a conversation with them or multiple conversations with them. But I'm, I've been working with someone who's in risk analytics and we're working on the book. And he's gotten to some of very experienced risk people and is able to demonstrate his capabilities and knowledge in the course of conversation. It's led to consulting work from them and material for his book. It all works, folks. You just have to have the guts to try it. And Exactly. And which service do you use for podcasting? I use Anchor and it's all free. So literally the, the startup cost for my podcast was... 
I want to say a hundred to $150, but you can do it for legitimately free if you wanted to by using anchor zoom. Um, and then your Apple headphone, um, headphones, if you wanted to do that. So it, the startup cost is less than $50 and even free. If you want to be, um, that, um, that savvy when it comes to finding free stuff. Exactly right. Hey, this has been fun. Find, how, do, how can people find out more about you, your show, your business, the whole kit and caboodle? <laughs> of course. So my number one platform um, is LinkedIn. So if you want to check me out on LinkedIn, it's LinkedIn forward slash IN forward slash Justin GCGU. And if you want to check out our website, it's www.getchogrindup.com. And that's G-E-T-C-H-O-G-R-I-N-D up.com. Um, those are sort of the two main places that I'm at right now. And then that website will lead you to the newsletter, which you'll get our cheat codes delivered to you once a week. And if you want the podcast, it's declassified college on any podcasting platform. Justin, this has been fabulous. And folks, we'll be back soon with more. This is Jeff Alpin, The Big Game Hunter. If you're interested in my coaching you, if you have questions, visit TheBigGameHunter.us. There's a button there where you can schedule time for a free discovery call or schedule time for coaching. I'd love to help you. And on LinkedIn, you can reach me at LinkedIn.com forward slash IN forward slash The Big Game Hunter. Mention that you saw the interview. I just like knowing where people are coming to me from. Once we're connected, if you're interested in coaching, you can message me that way, but it's, you can actually get on the schedule directly through the website. Lastly, I just want to encourage you. Don't be passive. Go out. Be great. Have a terrific day. Hope to be, be back in touch with you soon.